Hello and welcome to Johnston Canines Educating Zulu. In this series we're going to follow a puppy, my puppy, through her basic puppy training, her basic obedience training, and then on through her specialist training as she slips into a working role within the family. Now I like most of the new puppy owners at the moment, I've got seven tasks that I need to complete before going to puppy class. Okay, And these seven tasks are discounting the puppy socialisation which is really 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 important but some people don't have access to lots of other puppies until they actually make it to puppy class okay so we're going to address these first seven and deal with puppy socialization separately okay so, so as soon as we get our puppy we need to do what's called name association and that's getting the puppy to understand what its name is so in our case our puppy is called Zula and we want her to respond correctly to her name when called, right? preferably in the early stages just to look at us, just to give us an inclination that she recognises that we are talking about her or to her. Right? After this, and now we're on a list that goes in no particular order, obviously name recognition is very important first, and the rest of the list no particular order. We've got health and grooming, so health checking our dogs and grooming our dogs. Um, health checking our dogs we all must be able to do, we've all got to be able to check the eyes and the ears and the teeth and the nose and the pores, and give the body a general good rub down looking for lumps and bumps and ticks and that sort of thing. Um, grooming as aspects are very much breed specific, if you've got a breed that requires a lot of grooming then you're going to have to put a lot of effort into this, if you've got a breed that's got a really short coat requires not a lot of grooming at all then this is something that won't take you very long to master. All right. After this we're looking um, at, shall we say, house rules. So these are the do's and don'ts in your household. Things like, is the dog allowed on the sofa? Is it allowed upstairs? Is it allowed on your bed? These sort of things. All right. You set the rules to your house and then you enforce those rules as you see fit. All right. After house rules, shall we say, we can call, call it lead friendship. So this includes collars or anything else that you may put on your dog when you take it out for a walk outside in the real world. All right? As a baby puppy, first it's got to understand that it needs to have this thing on and it's got to become accustomed to that. So again, we'll address that topic a little bit later on in the series. Following lead friendship, we need to address food manners. What we expect our puppy to do when food is around, our food that the dog isn't allowed to have, uh, how we expect it to take food if we are giving it a reward or a tip bit, how we expect it to behave, and what we expect it to do whilst we're feeding it. So do we expect a little bit of control as we put in the bowl down, or are we happy with the puppy running around and jumping up as in the process of putting the bowl down? What goes in must come out the other end, so we've got to look at toilet training early on in our puppy's life and we've got sort of two choices there. We can just, as we see the puppy needing to go to the toilet, and indicators to this are sniffing around the corners of the room or perhaps even just come in and pestering you after a, a few weeks because it's, it's getting used to going outside. Um, on top of this we need to have our, our regular sort of toileting timetable. Young puppies, anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half, you want to be taking them outside to get them to toilet. And once you take them outside, you've got two choices. If you've got a large garden and you don't mind where the, the dog or the puppy goes to the toilet in, you can just take it outside and let it wander the garden until it's toileted. If you wanted to toilet in a specific area, which obviously means you haven't got to go searching the garden for the rogue dog poos, then take it to that specific area and get it to toilet in that specific area as a young dog, as a young puppy and then as it grows up and matures it's, it's always going to go to that area to toilet, it will just become second nature and you set out what, what you intend to happen and then you must see it through and that seeing it through includes when it's howling it down with rain and you've got to get your umbrella on or your coat on and go to that specific place in the garden right? it requires as much commitment from the owner as it, it does the dog Okay, so after toileting and last on our list of seven that we've got to achieve before we go to puppy class is bed training. Um, and this can include crate training if we crate our dogs. So this is getting our puppy to associate where we would like it to go and, and sleep, what we where we would like it to go and, and take up a comfortable position when we instruct it to go to its bed, which could be for any number of reasons, um, and to understand that going to its bed isn't a bad thing. So once we've cracked those sort of seven things, 
we progress on to puppy school, we introduce the puppy socialisation aspect and again I'm going to cover this in a different video of lots of footage of puppy socialisation so we can talk about it as we go through it. But whilst we're there we're, we're attending that, those puppy training classes in order to get our puppy to walk nicely on in the lead and have a strong recall. So achieving um, these two basic exercises, the heel on the lead and the recall back to you, is what we might consider to be basic trained. Okay, it's n it's not even covering the skills in a basic obedience class. It's the basic of basic training. If you've got really good heel work on the lead, you'll be able to walk your pet dog anywhere. If you've got a really strong recall, then you'll be able to let your dog off the lead anywhere, and it will come back to you no matter what the distractions are. Okay, achieving these two things without a lot of training is is often very very difficult. So that's where the practice needs to be put in. But if all you're looking for really is a good pet dog, then they're the two things that you've got to put a lot of effort into, having cracked the seven things prior to that. In order to achieve the objectives that we've set for ourselves, we need to start thinking about commands. Okay, if we think of it basically like this, commands are the sounds that we make at our dog, and we want those our dog to associate those different sounds with a different action. Okay, really important that we try to keep those sounds as short and as different from each other as possible. All right. So first, what do we need? Uh, we need a sound for walking nicely next to me. So historically in dog training that's been heel and when I was a lad being a second generation dog trainer heel was the word that was used for everything heel meant maintain that position to my left hand side regardless of where that position on my left hand side twisted and turned so if I was to turn right I would expect you to maintain that heel position on my left which is now twisted to the right I found very quickly as I became training dogs as, through my youth that I got a much better attentiveness from my dogs when I gave them an indicator as to which direction I would be turning. So when I turn right, personally I say close, and when I'm turning left, I say back. Right, so I've got heel for walk nicely next to me, close for maintaining that position as we turn through right X amount of degrees, and back and maintain that heel position as we rotate left through X amount of degrees. Next we're moving on to positions, so that would be the sit, the down and the stand. Again, try to keep those commands short, sharp and snappy, doesn't matter what language you're in, as long as it's short, sharp and snappy. We have a tendency as English speaking people to say things like sit down or lay down, try to avoid that. We want sit, we want down, we want stand or a short, sharp equivalent. On from positions, we're going to have weight. So weight we can think of as pause, we use it a lot. We use it more than anything else, definitely more than the stay, which we'll come to next. So think weight equals pause. So we say pause as we open the door because we don't want the dog to run out. We say pause as we halt at the side of the road. We're asking the dog to pause as we're putting the bowl of food down on the floor. We're asking it to pause as we put the lead on. There's lots of indicators, or rather times, that we can use that weight command. Weight means pause, expect me to ask you to do something else. Stay, however, is something different. Stay means stay there, don't move until I return and release you from that stay command. So when we're in thinking about our stay command, we also need to be thinking about a command that means the stay's finished. So I say stay, and to finish the, the exercise, I say finished. All right? It goes like stay, 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 I leave the dog, I return to the dog, and then I say finished, good boy, or finished, good girl, and deliver the reward. Moving on, we're thinking of off. So this is if the dog is on something that you do not want it on. That can be you, that can be the sofa, that can be the bed, any number of those things. We're using off as opposed to down. All right? Some folks will say get down, but then they've sort of abbreviated that sentence because it should go along the lines of get down off of there. Okay. So for the dog, we just want off. After off, we've got give. Give is um, obviously when your dog has something that you want in its mouth, you say give, it releases it. If we're teaching the dog to give, it might be a fun idea to teach the dog to fetch. Now I've got them that way around because not all dogs like to play fetch, but all dogs will be picking stuff up that you don't necessarily want them to have, so that's why we're introducing the give command. We must get a give command or a leave command. 
and it's to our hands not dropping it on the floor. If, our, if that dog's got something that we don't particularly want it to have and we, we command it to give and it drops it on the floor, it gives an opportunity for another dog to pick it up and then we're looking at the same problem. So we want to be able to take that article off the dog and have a word that means to release the article. So for me, it's give. Um, next we're moving on to know, which generally sort of means stop doing what you're doing. Um, and it can be applied to a variety of different things. Um, and along the same sort of lines, we'd be thinking of a command that means, or, or goes along the lines of leave. So you are you sort of catch the dog looking at something that it shouldn't be looking at. That could be food, it could be another dog, it could be a person, that sort of thing. You tell the dog to leave, i.e. don't go over there, don't investigate that. After that, we're thinking nicely, steady, okay? Now nicely and steady can be two different commands for two different things and I've put them together because often folks will mix the two up. Again, the sound is irrelevant, the word, the, the noise is more important and I know that sounds a little bit silly but you re can replace the sound with whatever you want as long as you keep using that sound. So for me, I use steady when I'm giving my dog a tidbit. All right, or somebody else is giving my dog a tidbit and I'll use nicely when I'm introducing my dog to something else, another dog, that is, not, not person. So I want the dog to behave itself when it's playing with another dog, so in my head that triggers the command nicely and when I'm giving it food I want it to be steady because I don't want the ends of my fingers taken off. Again, feel free to swap these around. Last on the list for me is eat. So I'm asking the dog to, to wait, to pause whilst I place the bowl of food on the floor. I then need another command to tell the dog that it's now okay to eat that food. And for me, that's eat. All right. Now there's one, less, one other command that um, handlers might add if they operate slightly different to me. Now as I mentioned, I'm a second generation dog trainer. So as a child, I had it sort of beat into me that if I want to stop our dogs running, I shout down because they can't run and lay down at the same time. Now, I've had that tested in emergency situations more times than I'd like to, to account for, um, and I know that works with my dogs, and I know that I shout down in an emergency. You have to think to yourself now, what will you shout in an emergency? Um, take away all the expletives as it were and then use what you're left with but that word has to be agreed on by everybody in the house it's really really important you can't shout down to stop your dog and have your partner shout stop okay it won't translate through your training very efficiently at all so that's all the commands that we need to think about please like the video subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so find and press that notifications button so you don't miss out on any of the rest of the series and I look forward to seeing you again with the star of the show Zula thank you very much goodbye <laughs>